The next speaker does not have the word art as his surname, but he would surely love to talk about it. Andrew Phoebe is an art, let's say, enthusiast, film and English, and theory of knowledge teacher at our school. And he's going to give us a speech about handwork. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello. This afternoon, I will talk about some things that are close to my heart. Language, images, the importance of making things, hands. I'm not here to congratulate you on who you are. I want to be a splinter under your fingernail or some grit in your eye. This afternoon, BISB TEDx is asking you to update your operating system. Update your operating system. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have an operating system. I'm not a machine. I'm not a robot. I do not come pre-programmed out of the box. I have DNA and genes. My genes express themselves and are influenced by my diet, my environment, my interaction with the world, not according to some master plan. I'm more than my genetic code. I'm my experience, my education, my relationships. I am my desire and my will, my past and my future. At times, I am flooded with ideas and thoughts. At other times, I am a sea of emotions. Remarkably, at my age, hormones still rage inside me. I'm a human, a frail, messy, mortal human. I am not some lines of code. And neither are any of you. Lazy metaphors must be challenged. They must be challenged because images evoke something powerful. They evoke a worldview which is clearly wrong. This overused simplistic metaphor that our brains, our minds, ourselves are nothing more than a computer needs to be challenged and changed. The metaphor needs to be changed because it suggests that we don't have free will, that we cannot escape our pre-programmed destiny, that everything is inevitable. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not true. All of us have free will. We all have the power to make choices and to shape our destinies. We need to be careful with the words we use because the language we use reveals how we think. A metaphor is more than just words. A metaphor is an image pregnant with meaning and pregnant things give birth. Images are powerful. That's why language uses imagery. The effect of images is absolute and irrevocable. Images provoke and evoke. Their meaning slides away from words. They're mysterious and immediate and troubling. We think in images. In the palace of the mind, the image is the king and the queen. Images rule. They ring in our heads like a, like a bell. I like to make images. I like to paint pictures. I don't know why I do that. But when I do do that, I know that I want my life to be crushed into these things like a car crash, like Maria Callas. Another reason why I don't like this metaphor, this metaphor that we are computers, is because clearly people are not computers. The way computers work is simple, predictable. You work on your computer and you know what will happen. People are not simple and they're certainly not predictable or logical. Believe me, I'm a teacher and a father. The real world is unpredictable. At times, it is dangerous. The digital world is safe, comfortable. Digital gives you a choice of yes or no. The real world is more complex than that. Sometimes there isn't a yes or a no. Sometimes it's a maybe or a I don't know. The real world is messy. It is analog. And it is this world that makes us human. It is imperfect. It has mistakes, anomalies, problems, paradoxes. I like to run in the forest, and in the forest there's mud and stones and stuff like weather and sometimes annoying dogs and sometimes annoying people. The other stuff out there in the forest, which is not part of the actual running, makes the running exciting. The trees, the sunlight, the deer. Think about that. 
It's the non-running stuff that makes the running good. It would be hard to get the same sort of feeling running on a machine in the gym. Okay, okay, but technology is not all bad. I'm not a Luddite. Videos, photographs taken with mobile phones and uploaded to social media sites have challenged and changed bad political systems. They have caused social revolutions, and that has to be good. Technology is best, like anything, when it empowers us, not when it controls us. Remember, we are not computers. We are not simple yes-no machines. What happens when you interact with a screen? A TV screen, a computer screen, a tablet, a phone, what happens? I think what happens is we become prisoners. We become lost. We become separated. We become trapped in a cycle of limited possibilities. During the golden age of the cinema, the silver screen, we could escape into the world of fantasy and longing. The screen was projected onto, and it was up there, big, larger than life, flamboyant, decadent, marvelous. Now, the screen is tiny. It fits into our pockets, and our ambition seems to have been reduced with this. It used to be religion, but now the screen seems to be the opium of the people. Take a minute to observe. People are busily sitting somewhere, Adam probably up there, fiddling with their screens, interacting with something distant and removed from the reality that surrounds them. I was having dinner the other day with a friend, and I was looking at these, um, these two people. You know, he was on his tablet, she was on her phone. Uh, they didn't speak to each other. I don't know, maybe they were strangers. Maybe they're having a text argument. I hate you. You stink. Big Brother has won. Not with the big screen on the wall, but with the little one in your pocket. Plug in, tap, swipe, zone out. When you rely on a computer or a screen, you are arbitrating the world in a sensual, intellectual, and moral poverty. You are living by proxy. How you interact with the world is important. So, what is the answer? The answer is the real world. What happens when we engage with the real world and try and make something, then we are immediately faced with the hardness and resilience of the world. The real world is tough and unpredictable. The real world does not come in handy bite-sized chunks. The real world does not respond with a click or a double tap. Even a little bit of gardening can be dangerous for some of us. The world is a hard and an obstinate thing. It does not bend to our will very easily. When we try to make something in the real world, we are faced with the stubbornness of it. It does not want to help us in our ambitions and dreams. It is inert and resilient. Making things takes time. It's hard. Yet, making things is extremely satisfying. I'm not talking about getting in the zone of being absorbed. What happens when you try to make something is not just creativity, but there's, there's worth, satisfaction. It becomes valuable to us as people. It enriches our spirit. It colors our lives. It makes us better in some way. What we see then is the world is full of richness and vitality, of infinite possibility of pattern, material, texture, shape, color, sound. There's also something else I realized, that when you make something with your hands, something remarkable happens. We want whatever we're making to be good. Not just good, but maybe the best thing. We care about it. When we go to the trouble of baking a cake, we want that cake to be delicious. We don't want it to be rubbish. When we make things with our hands, we start to care about what we're making. We want it to be great. We try hard. When we make something with our hands, we have an idea of how it can be. We imagine, we dream. We know what it is we want before that thing exists. Think about that. It's pretty amazing. When we make something with our hands, we feel good. The work of the hand is noble. Your hands connect you directly with the world. When you work with your hands, your entire body, mind, spirit is engaged and absorbed. When you go into a shop to buy something, or even if you go into a shop to steal something, 
and I don't recommend it, the transaction can only have one possibility. Yes, no, money, stuff, on, off. But when you make something, whatever that is, the transaction is immediately complex. It involves work, materials, time, effort, intelligence, creativity, skill, and sometimes luck. The relationship is completely different. It involves a completely different value system. My message to you is that you are free. You have free will. You can decide what to do. And we're not victims of our bodies or our genes. We don't need to update our operating system because we don't have or need one. The world is not a flat screen. Be active. Don't be passive. Turn off your phone. Pull out those earphones. Those operating systems are turning us into self-obsessed shells. The virtual world is bland and sterile. The real world is a Rococo castle exploding sensually with opportunity and possibility. It is rich, fertile, fecund. Today I urge you, I implore you, re-engage with the world. Engage deeply, sensually with your environment. Interact. Use your hands to make something. Make something that is interesting to look at, to touch, to use. We are not machines or robots. We are sentient, charged, sensual beings, raw with emotion and bristling with intellect and curiosity. We need a new metaphor to live by. We need a new metaphor to explain ourselves to ourselves. Get out there into the big, ugly, beautiful, terrible, uncompromising, unpredictable real world. Breathe the pollution. Skin your knees. Go and make something.